Where we left our story last week, we were in the wilderness by the Jordan River with this guy named John, shows up at the beginning of Matthew. He's a prophet that's come, he's a little bit quirky. He dresses in a way that's kind of weird, camel hair, clothes, got to be a little itchy. Dresses in a way that makes him look more prophet-like, prophetic. I don't know what you call it. So his dress is a little bit weird. His diet is a little bit weird. Specifically, he's eating locust and wild honey, whatever he can find. Uh, sort of an eccentric guy. But he has an important role here because he's going to be the guy that paves the way for Jesus. And see, the law has to come before the gospel because without the law... There's no need for the gospel. You need that initial law to come and point out our deficit, point out our need, that the gospel fills that need. And so Paul writes about in his letters how the law shows us how sinful we are, and then the gospel swoops in and saves us. And so John is the forerunner for Jesus. He's going to come. He's going to lay down the law. And he's known, of course, as John the Baptist. He gets this name from this new practice that he institutes, this baptism. What is his baptism? Well, it's this declaration of repentance from sin. That first you change your mind. You admit that you are a sinner. You own up to your own ability to break the law, your inability to keep it. Instead of excusing yourself, you begin accusing yourself. And so you change your mind and then you change your life. You live in a way that speaks to that repentance. You put a flag in the ground and say, from this point forward, I'm going to live righteously. You try to bear fruit that shows that repentance. And so this is John's baptism, and that's as far as it could go. It didn't save anybody. It just got them ready for Jesus, and it got them ready for the baptism that Jesus is going to inaugurate. Now, when we last saw Jesus in Matthew, he was a toddler. He was a little baby Jesus. Now, we're 30 years into the future. We zoom up, and now he's a man. And he's coming, and he's beginning his ministry. And it starts in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Matthew writes this, he says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now there's three things about Jesus that I want to zoom in on here this week. The first is his humility, second is his identity, and the third is his work. So we get our first glimpse of Jesus in it's not really what people were expecting. The Jews had all these ideas about what the Messiah was going to be like. He was going to come and he was going to institute God's kingdom here on earth, which meant, well, he's going to have to overthrow Rome. It's going to be this bloody revolt. He'll be this mighty warrior. He'll come in and he'll just take everybody out and boom, God's kingdom reigns on earth. It's not really what Jesus does. They thought, Messiah is here. He's coming to save us, and he's going to save us from Rome. That's not really what Jesus is there to do. We don't see Jesus get terribly interested in fighting battles with Rome. He doesn't really seem to be into overthrowing the government. He comes to save them, not from Rome's sin, but from their own sin. And so John the Baptist, he definitely had some ideas about Jesus. And what we see here when Jesus shows up is they're way different than he expected them to be. i got to think maybe he was a little disappointed. Because here John's preaching, the one who's coming after me, he's coming to baptize. 
And then Jesus shows up and goes, hey, John, I need you to baptize me. It's like, this is backwards. You're supposed to. What, what are you talking about? That's weird. That's not how this is supposed to go. John says he's coming, and he's coming with wrath. The axe is at the root of the tree. He's cutting them all down. He's clearing the forest. And instead, Jesus comes with humility. He comes rather inconspicuously. John says he's coming, he's bringing the Holy Spirit and fire. And the Holy Spirit shows up, but it doesn't show up like fire, it shows up like a dove. It's not the sign of destruction, it's the sign of peace. And so it's not exactly how John pictured it. And he protests, like, you should be baptizing me. Jesus has to tell him, like, yeah, yeah, sure, but right now we've got to do this, all right? and then we'll move on. You miss a lot of what Jesus says and does and the impact of it if you miss that he's constantly defying people's expectations. They, everyone has this idea of, well, this is what the Messiah is going to come and this is what he's going to do. And where everyone zigs, Jesus zags. He does everything a little bit different than he's supposed to do it. They misunderstood what he was here for. They misunderstood what he was going to do. And now it's easy for us often to hold that against them in hindsight. You're like, well, how could they miss this? Like, of course, the Messiah was going to come, and he wasn't going to set up a kingdom. He was going to be crucified and die and rise again, and then we were going to... Yeah, how, how do they miss this? What are these dummies reading, right? But it's not fair, because we have this perspective now, looking back on it, that we can see all of this. And we see it, and we see Jesus say, look, all Scripture is about me. And this is where it talks about me, and he should... So, they didn't have any of that. So they had all these expectations, and Jesus goes the other way on a lot of them. They miss it. We can't fault them for it. How many times in our lives does God do something differently than we would have expected it? After all, I did come to Lakeside to be the associate pastor, right? God had different plans. I wouldn't have written the story this way. I surely would have left out the chapter about the chronic migraine, all that. Like, he had different plans. Sometimes God's wisdom doesn't make a whole lot of sense until we look back in hindsight. And there are some things that God has planned that aren't going to make sense until we look back with eternal hindsight. But God has this fantastic sense of irony. It's one of the things that I've really come to appreciate about him, more that I read Scripture, and is that he's always just twisting people's expectations. Like, ah, you think I'm going to do this, but now nah, I'm going to do this. Ah, you think it goes this way, but now nah, it goes this way, actually. It's like this, <laughs> it's almost like this rebellious streak. Like, can you be a rebel and have never sinned? Like, it's just like he wants to go in the face of what everybody is saying. And so here comes Jesus, and instead of coming out and looking like a warrior, looks like a country bumpkin. Like Galilee, that's an agricultural area. Jesus is from the middle of nowhere. He just spent 30 years building tables. And he just walks out. It's like, hey, I'm here to get baptized. Like no pretense, no nothing. Frederick Bruner comments that he believes this to be Jesus' first miracle. The miracle of his humility. That he comes with this humility that's out of this world. Literally. That he would go to John and have John baptize him. This is the same Jesus that created John and created the Jordan River and the wilderness and water, chemicals, molecules, atoms. Not only did he create all of it, he holds it all together and it is all created for him. And he comes to John and says, hey, I need you to baptize me. The humility here is unbelievable. Be like if we were in the park throwing a football around, like Aaron Rodgers walked up and was like, hey, show me how you're throwing that spiral there. <laughs> like, dude, you're the expert here. Like, not me. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. You should be teaching me. You're the expert. I'm not. And that's kind of how John feels here, I bet. Like, what? You want me to baptize you? This is backwards. I've got a friend in D.C., who's in the Air Force, and he's worked some events for the White House and things like that, and he was telling us this one time about how they're doing this event, and he's got to sort of corral everyone and get them back to their seats. The president's coming in, they're about to get started. And he walks up to this guy, some politician, and is like, hey, sir, I'm going to have to ask you to take your seat. 
And the guy gives him one of those, like, well, do you have any idea who you're talking to sort of thing? And just unflinching, he's like, well, I know you're not the president, so I'm going to need you to take your seat. <laughs> if you're ever writing a piece of fiction, screenplay, novel, short story, whatever it may be, you want to make a character seem arrogant, there's one question you can have them ask that gets the job done really easily and efficiently. And it's this. Do you know who I am? Because look, if you have to ask that question, only one of two things can be true. Okay, Number one, the person doesn't know who you are because you're not nearly as important as you think you are. Or two, the person knows who you are and doesn't care because you're not nearly as important as you think you are, right? This can only end badly for you. It's like heads I win, tails you lose sort of thing here. And so, but if anyone in history has the right to appear that way, to sort of present himself and say, well, do you guys not get who I am? It's Jesus. He's the only one that you can really say, yeah, he's that important. That if you missed it, it's on you. That you really got to get who this guy is, what he's all about. But that's not what he does. If anyone has the right to do it, it's him. It's not what he does. Instead of coming and demanding that other people serve him, he comes and serves other people. Instead of coming and demanding his rights, he comes and just gives them up freely again and again. Jesus is willing to look bad. I mean, think about it. baptism. What is it? Who is it for? Who is baptism for? It's for sinners. It's for people admitting, hey, I can't do this on my own. I'm a failure at keeping the law. I need to be cleansed. And Jesus gets right down there with all of them. He doesn't need it. But there he is. People probably looked at him and didn't think anything special of him. Well, yet, but we'll get there. Let's not jump ahead. It's the opposite of hype right here. As Jesus shows up as nondescript, as unpretentious as possible. This kind of humility is uncommon. It was uncommon back then when humility was seen as a character flaw and not a virtue. Now we think of it as a virtue, but yeah, no, let's not get too crazy with it, right? And he comes with this tremendous sense of humility. And I wonder if humility is something that stands in the way of some people being baptized. That like, you think, well, I don't want people to think that I need this, or maybe it's been too long. I've been in a church for way too long, and now if I do this, people are going to think that, you know, that I haven't had it all together or something. Maybe there's that worry about how other people are going to perceive you that kind of stands in the way there a little bit. But Jesus doesn't show any pretense. He's like, this needs to happen. It's going to happen. I don't really care what other people think. John, you going to baptize me or what? Let's do this. And so along with this rare humility of Jesus, we also get this insight into his identity. This baptism is sort of the inauguration of his ministry. In January, we'll inaugurate a new president. He'll stand on the steps of the Capitol, swear in, do the whole deal. And then from that moment on, they're the president. Jesus sort of has his inauguration here in the Jordan River. It's from this moment on, his ministry begins. And what we see here is we see that he's the Messiah. We talked last week about the silent years, this idea that the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew that they believed that God had stopped speaking, that he had gone silent. And so if anyone thought, well, I've got this word from God, but no, you don't. Be silent. And here God breaks the silence, literally. He speaks out loud. Matthew writes that everybody hears it. It's this audible thing for everyone. And what he says here is sort of this mashup of two passages from the Old Testament. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And so part of that comes from Isaiah 42, 1. It says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Seems like the large consensus is that that verse is sort of referenced here in what God speaks over Jesus. One of the roles that we see Jesus fulfill is exactly that. He's the servant of God who's going to come and bring about the kingdom of God. His ministry, his work, it starts 
here. Previously, Jesus has been working in obscurity. He's been doing carpentry. He's been keeping to himself. Now, he's going to come out. He's going to do the work that he came here to do. And it's not just that he's the Messiah. He's also the Son of God. The other verse is Psalm 2.7. It says, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And now we take this for granted because we're all introduced to Jesus as the Son of God. It's something that we just understand. Even if this is the first time you've ever been in church, you're probably aware that well, what Christians believe is that this Jesus fellow is the Son of God. We just take that for granted. This is a radically new idea that he introduces. You see all throughout the Old Testament that God is called Lord, he's called Provider, he's called all these things. He's never called Father. That's something that Jesus brings it says, this is, how, this is how I address him. This is how you can address him too. When he teaches the disciples how to pray, this is how you should pray. Address him as Father. Go to him in that manner. It's this new spin on who God is and how we relate to him. What does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, it definitely does not mean that God created Jesus. John makes this very clear in the way he starts his gospel. So he starts it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it's existed with him forever. It's with him, so they're together, but it also is him. So there's this idea of the Trinity that John sort of wraps up, at least two-thirds of it right there. That coexistent forever equals, but also the same. And so, son doesn't mean, well, Jesus is inferior or that God created him. No, not at all. What it means, well, first and foremost, is that Jesus is God. Just as John had written, Jesus is God. This is another thing that we sort of take for granted. Back then, scandalous idea that one person walking around, that you could see that that person was God. You get stoned for that. But the early church worshipped him as God from the start. So what we see here as his ministry starts. Not only is he God, he and the Father have this unique relationship. There's this unique affection that's shared between the two of them. There's this relationship of infinite love that goes back and forth between the Son and the Father that no other relationship shares. He calls him my beloved Son. So we get these insights into who Jesus is. We get this insight into what he's like. And we also learn about the nature of his work, this ministry that he's starting here. First, it says he's going to fulfill all righteousness. Now, that's a phrase that's hotly debated. This is what I think it means. is that Jesus is coming, and he's going to do everything there is to do to be a righteous person. He's going to run the table, A through Z. Everything you could possibly do, he's going to do. So that if you want to know what does it look like to be righteous, you look at Jesus and you do what he did. And so this makes baptism important for us. Why? Because Jesus does it. He comes and he does it and says, this is part of what I'm doing to fulfill righteousness, to set that standard. And then he tells his disciples, when you make converts, baptize them. And so it's something we have to take seriously. It may seem outdated. It may seem weird. Why are we dunking people in water? What's this all about? Jesus did it. Then Jesus commanded it. And then the, Old Test the New Testament church kept running with it. They kept it going. It's something that's important. It's baked into this. And so Jesus fulfills all righteousness. He also pleases the Father in his work. He shows us what it's like to please God. In John's Gospel, he makes explicit this is what pleases God. In John 10, 17, he says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. So what do you see there? That I lay down my life that I may take it up again. You see his humility. He's willing to lay down his life. And you see his obedience, that he's going to lay down his life. So what pleases God? Obedience and humility. What do we see from Jesus in this baptism? Obedience and humility. If we want to please God, what should we bring him? Obedience and humility. The spectacular thing, though, is that Jesus earns this righteousness. He fulfills all of it, sets this standard that's impossible. He gets this righteousness, and then he gives it to us. 
The New Testament writers use this phrase over and over again, in Christ. That when you put your faith in Jesus, you've made him the center of your life, they say you are in Christ. You can think of it like a legal term. So you're standing before God. You are in Christ. What this means is that when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. Sure, he's still aware of our sin and he still disciplines us. He still helps us work through that and come out of that sin. It's this process called sanctification was just a fancy word for becoming more like Jesus. But when we're to be judged, the evidence is piled up against us. And in my case, it's overwhelming. Guilty. And then Jesus stands up and goes, now he's with me. And charges are dropped. All of that righteousness that he has earned, he gives to us. And so what happens when we're in Christ? Well, let me show you. In Romans 8, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation means it doesn't matter what's on the other side of the ledger. doesn't count. It's all wiped away. No condemnation whatsoever. You're free to go. Nothing gets between us and him. The evidence speaks against us, but Jesus has the final say. We are in Christ. We can't be separated from the love of God. In 2 Corinthians, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So we're this brand new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new is here. This is one of the reasons why we can't live just any way that we want. Because we can't be a new creation for God and then still purposefully keep ourselves slaves to sin. Paul goes, this doesn't work. This doesn't fit together. It's incongruous. You get to pick one. And that doesn't mean that we're going to get it perfect. We're not going to get it perfect. I guarantee that we won't. We are going to fail. We are going to stumble. But God looks at us still. When we are in Christ, he looks at us and sees Jesus. The righteousness that Jesus fulfills, that he lives and dies and rises for, it's all ours. If you've given your life to Jesus, it's yours. Nothing you can do to earn it. You can't work really hard. It doesn't work. He's earned it and he gives it to us. And now, I'm not talking about fire insurance, so to speak, here. That's what I was getting at last week. This idea that, well, I say I believe in God and now I have carte blanche to just do whatever I want. Because, well, I've got this get-out-of-jail-free card in my back pocket. It's like, well, I'm, I'm clear and free, right? That's how this works. I prayed this prayer once, and so I'm good. It's like, well, no. If that's your mentality, it shows me you didn't really understand this in the first place. It's not this, like, passive, oh, I believe in Jesus. There we go. Matter solved. Like, that's not putting your faith in him. Faith has to be backed up with action. Faith is another word for confidence. You've got to put your faith in him by action. It, there should be some evidence. Think about it this way. If I told you that I was bulletproof, that you could shoot me in the chest and bounces right off, Superman style, it's the craziest thing, what would you want to do? Would you would want to run and grab a gun and test this out? It's like, i got to see this. But then if every single time you did that, I had an excuse like, well, no, man, I just had Mexican, maybe not today, or like whatever. <laughs> and I would never let you shoot me. Well, you would likely start to suspect this whole bulletproof thing is not for real, right? Because I'm not backing this statement up with any action. There's no, my confidence does not actually seem to be there and my bulletproofness. And so that's what it's like when someone's like, yeah, I believe in God, but then they don't change a thing about their lives. After enough times passed, it's like, I don't really think you understood this. Doesn't mean we have to be perfect to earn salvation. Of course not. There's no amount of doing good that we can do to earn this. Nothing. It's not like, well, you got a 64, you barely passed, you're in. Like, no. You can't earn it. But if you're not trying to follow God's commands at all, well, that tells me the Holy Spirit's not living and active in your life. 
that tells me you haven't actually oriented your life around Jesus. But when we do, when we make Jesus the centerpiece of our lives that everything else revolves around, then we're in Christ. And when we're in Christ, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. When we're in Christ, that righteousness that Jesus has earned, he gives us for free. When we're in Christ, God looks at us and says, this is my son, this is my daughter, with whom I am well pleased. And so to recap what we've sort of learned about baptism over the past couple weeks, one, it's the outward sign of inward repentance. You repent, and then you're baptized. That's what we see here. That's what we see all throughout Scripture. That's the reason why we don't do infant baptism here at Lakeside. It's because infants can't repent. They need to, <laughs> but they can't do it. And that's not to say that there's no value in that practice. There are a bunch of churches that do it. And I think there is value in it, but it's not the same thing that I see here when John and Jesus in the early church in Acts talk about baptism. It doesn't seem to be the same thing to me. So we do baby dedication here, which is sort of our way to take the things that we think are useful, that we think are great about infant baptism, sort of work that into the way we do church, and not at the same time muddy the waters with what baptism seems to be in Scripture. Repentance means walking away from your sin. You go from excusing to accusing yourself. You change your mind, you change your life. Ultimately, baptism says, I want to do the will of God more than anything else. It's also a symbol of the death of sin. Remember, there's this drowning implied in the word baptism. That it's written that these sailors who drowned on their ships, they were baptized into the ocean. When a city is flooded with people and it's just mass chaos, it was baptized with people. There's this forcefulness there, the decision for baptism. It's this decision to live a life of righteousness. Finally, baptism follows both the example and the commands of Jesus. So here's his example. This is what it looks like to be righteous. And he shows us the way. And then when he goes to leave his disciples, he tells them, and as you go, when you make converts, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so if you're interested in taking this step of faith, we're doing baptisms next week. Do them right over here. The kiddie pool is dead. Goodbye, kiddie pool. Good riddance. We've got a portable baptistry that we're borrowing that, uh, you know, it'll be good waist-high water. Um, I can't guarantee it's going to be terribly warm water, but it's going to be waist-high. It's not going to be super awkward. Stand up, do the dunk, be great. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you're interested in that, uh, I'm going to be meeting with folks in my office uh, right after the service. You can just pop in there and there's not a ton to talk about because I feel like I've covered it all pretty well here this morning and last week. Uh, but we'll go over some brief logistics uh, and, then, and then we'll be on our way. We'll get you scored away. Uh, if you show up next week, you're like, you know what? I changed my mind. On second thought, I actually do want to be baptized. Well, we'll just dunk you anyway. You can go home wet. And it's fine. <laughs> we see this incredible humility that Jesus shows here. That he, we know, ends his ministry on a cross between two thieves. He begins his ministry in a river surrounded by sinners. And he does this to set the standard to earn this righteousness that he just gives us for free. So when we're in Christ, he looks at us. God looks at every one of us and says, This is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this incredible gift of Your grace that You've offered to each and every one of us. I pray that You would stir in all of our hearts a passion for You and for Your Word and and for righteousness, that we would 
seek to honor you with our lives, that we would put our faith and our dependence, our confidence in what you have done, and that from that would spring a life of worship to you. Pray that that would be pleasing to you, that you would guide us and help us in this walk. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.